Thank you for coming at this obscenely early hour to this presentation on behalf of Greens List Psychiatric Injury Cases under the Accident Compensation Act. Um, our speakers today are both well credentialed to talk on this topic. They're both extremely well experienced and I've had the privilege of working with both of them. And I can say with confidence that they're very well versed in the area. Our next speaker is Fiona Ryan, who's going to talk about common law cases, um, of which there are quite a few, but many in the pipeline. Um, Fiona's uh, been at the bar for five years, having been a solicitor for three years before that <coughs> at Holding Redlick, where she worked in the Injuries Law Department, but also worked in common, uh, commercial litigation, uh, gaining er experience in areas of contract disputes, bankruptcy and insolvency. She's a, a published author on uh, TAC benefits for children and uh, wrote another document, uh, Solicitors Acting Against Former Clients, which was published in the Young Lawyers Journal. She practices extensively in accident compensation, administrative law and commercial litigation. She's an experienced and competent young solicitor and I'm sure her paper today will be very informative. Please welcome Fiona Ryan. Thanks, David. I'll be talking mainly about um, overwork cases, or as I've referred to them, um, jobs which are inherently stressful, and also talking about these bullying and harassment claims, um, which are increasingly common, um, both at the statutory benefits level and, of course, at common law. There's been a development in the common law, particularly over the last 10 years, in the sense it is now recognised that psychiatric illness can be triggered by stress. Um, certainly 10, 15 years ago, employers would argue that it's, it wasn't reasonably foreseeable that work could cause a psychiatric illness as distinct from stress. Um, but recent case law has made it clear that that, that concept is well known. Um, I've just set out there the basic um, duty owed by an employer to an employee. You'll all be familiar with the case of Curler. Um, it was an overwork case in the sense that the plaintiff was employed or the worker was employed as a sales representative. She was initially employed full time and later retrenched and then rehired as a part-time merchandising representative. Her complaint was um, she had too many stores to visit, too big an area to canvas and too little time uh, in which to do her work. During the course of em her employment, she made many complaints to management, both orally and in writing, about her workload. None of the complaints, however, suggested that her health was adversely affected. And this was critical um, to the High Court's decision finding against her. Despite her complaints, that is her complaints of the workload being too much, no action was taken by management. She had suggested um, things should change. She should either be given more time to do the work or, or assistance um, with how to do it. She developed, first of all it was thought she had a physical illness but she was later diagnosed with fibromyalgia and major depressive illness. So she claimed in negligence um, and breach of contract and breach of the relevant statutory duty under the Western Australian law. As I said before, um, it was in Curler that the High Court acknowledged that it is now general knowledge that recognisable psychiatric illnesses may be triggered by, may be triggered by stress. The, um, the court also placed some emphasis or significant emphasis on her contract of employment and the sanctity of that contract in the sense of the employer being entitled to assume the employees up to the job by signing on to the job. And this, is, this, is, this has been reflected in more recent cases in Victoria and Queensland. 
So in that sense it was found that because the worker agreed to undertake the task stipulated, um, that ran contrary to the idea that she was, she was suffering from any problem or would have suffered from or was at risk of suffering from a psychiatric illness. In Curler, the um, reasonable foreseeability was determinative and in the High Court held that it wasn't reasonably foreseeable um, that the worker in that case would suffer a psych psychiatric problem in that despite all her complaints, none of the complaints to the employer indicated she was having um, psychiatric problems. So that is why in that case she didn't succeed. The next few cases I want to um, bring to your attention I've labelled inherently stressful work cases. Um, they're cases <coughs> involving police officers, ambulance officers um, and another case which I'll come to but um, all of which are, are not just simple overwork cases but something about the work it, it can be argued is inherently stressful. This case of Hegarty is a uh, Queensland Court of Appeal case. The worker in that case was an ambulance officer of some 15 years. Um, during the course of his employment he was exposed to traumatic and distressing scenes. He was never provided with, with any counselling or assistance. He ceased his employment um, and was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. There was no evidence, however, that he told supervisors he was suffering from psychological distress and no evidence that he informed them about his nightmares and flashbacks. So we come back to the situation in Curla in the sense that the employer um, arguably was ignorant about the worker, either the worker having suffered these problems or being vulnerable to these psych psychiatric problems. The ambulance officer alleged that his employer should have had a system in place whereby his supervisors were trained to identify signs of dysfunction which then would have led them to invite him to seek help which would have prevented, would have prevented the injury. The Court of Appeal held that um, well found against the worker on the grounds of it wasn't reasonably foreseeable and as you'll see there um, the held it was difficult to see how a layman in the position of a supervisor could have been alerted that he was not coping with the stresses of his job and the complaints he actually made um, were that he wanted to move out move out of the job itself and he wanted to transfer and that was because of um, certain factors in relation to his family life and so on and the court referred to this issue of an industrial relations problem which is also referred to in Curler and that is um, while they conceded that as an ambulance officer the special nature of his work should make his supervisors alert for signs of dysfunction he, the actual complaints he made which were the court referred to as industrial relation problems rather than complaints about his mental health um, were not apt to warrant a response from the employer. So in that case the Queensland Court of Appeal really took up the language of Curler and followed that idea of the difference between complaints in relation to what they referred to an industrial relations problem and complaints that should alert an employer to a, a problem in relation to psychiatric vulnerability. Um, there are of course inherent difficulties in relation to these psychiatric injury cases founded on either stress or overwork um, and I've just included a quote there from Justice Appeal Keane as he then was and that is in relation to the difficulties an employer may face um, in terms of reasonably well foreseeing that a worker may be vulnerable to those sort of stresses. <coughs> 
and of course it is much more difficult um, in these sort of cases than in physical injury cases. And then there's also the question of how far should the scope of the duty extend? And that is how far or what measures should an employer take um, to try to assess a worker's psychiatric condition? And um, there's a recent Victorian case which I'll come to which go goes into this and it's really also a policy consideration and that is um, how far should an employer probe into an employee's mental state. Next case um, is Hardy. That's a Victorian Supreme Court case, a decision of Justice J. Forrest. Actually, I believe David Curtin was involved in this case. Um, this is a case the plaintiff was employed as a service technician and the company installed and serviced dust collection equipment and the plaintiff was required to spend sig significant time travelling to regional Victoria and interstate, um, staying in accommodation arranged by the employer. The court found, for example, that in 2004, which is which his final year of work before he ceased due to injury, he spent about 56 nights away. During his periods away, that is, in the, in the accommodation with other fellow workers, um, marijuana was smoked and they also drank alcohol after work hours in, in the motel. The plaintiff argued that he used marijuana, for example, to mask his upset at being away at home. Being away from home, he missed his wife and children. He, his case was that he constantly asked the service manager to reduce his time away. He used to tell him it was a pain leaving his kids and it was getting to him. In January um, 2003, he was on annual leave and his condition deteriorated significantly and he spent time in an inpatient hospital. He then returned to work in June 2003. His employer um, knew that he was enrolled in a drug and alcohol rehabilitation course, but in June 2003, he returned to full-time work and back on the travel work. So that is, he continued to perform the work um, which involved him spending periods away from home. He became depressed and resumed his drinking and drug taking and finally ceased work in October 2004. Um, you'll see there he alleged three breaches of duty of care requiring him to work regularly far away from home while knowing that in his spare time he would be mixing with other workers who were likely to be consuming excessive amounts of alcohol and drugs, requiring him to be away from home for long periods of time with the knowledge it was causing him injury. And then the third one, um, which proved to be more difficult for the plaintiff, failing to prevent or limit the consumption of alcohol and or marijuana after hours by his fellow employees. In relation to that third breach of duty, that is the, um, the employer failed to prevent or limit other employees consuming alcohol and drugs. Justice Forrest held that the employer's duty does not extend to an employer being able to dictate to its workers what they can and cannot do after hours. Um, he placed some emphasis on personal responsibility in relation to drinking. He referred to the recent High Court decision of Tandara Motorin in which the High Court found um, that a publican did not owe a duty to a patron to control his or her excessive drinking. Um, he also made comment that the, it, the fact that the employer had a lack of control over the employee's drinking after hours um, that lack of control is general, generally a persuasive indication as to whether any legal duty is owed. And as I said, there, there are also he, policy considerations about individuals making choices and being free to drink after work if they so wished.
the first two allegations made by the plaintiff, and that is the employer should not have required him to work regularly far away from home um, when it knew that he'd be mixing with other workers who regularly consumed excessive amounts of alcohol and drugs, or alternatively requiring him to be away from home for long periods of time when it knew it was causing injury. Um, Justice Forrest found that those, those two allegations were tenable at least because the defendant did owe the plaintiff a duty of care in relation to its system of rostering because it was an integral part of his job um, and he was required, that he was required to undertake these trips. However, the case um, for the plaintiff failed um, for a number of reasons, but um, Justice Forrest did not accept that the employer was aware he was at risk of psychological injury. He did not accept the plaintiff made complaints to the superior to a superior about being the being away from home was causing him real problems. There was evidence that a lot of employees grumbled from time to time about being away from their families and so forth, but that was not enough. And we come back to this idea of really the courts have been putting the onus on the employees to alert their employer as to their psychiatric vulnerability rather than just, I don't want to be away from my family or I'd rather move to a different part of, part of the department or, or something like that. Um, further, there was no evidence that the plaintiff's performance or, um, had become impaired or that management should have been aware that he was um, carrying out his tasks inadequately. And there was no evidence from any doctors that um, the employer should have been aware that working away from home was likely to cause the plaintiff injury. So that is, um, the plaintiff in fact received a medical clearance to return to full-time work after he'd had that initial breakdown. Justice Forrest also made comments in relation to this contractual um, issue and that, that's what was raised in Curler in that the plaintiff voluntarily signed a contract of employment. He knew what he was getting into. Um, he was not forced to travel for long periods. He could have resigned at any time. He made no formal request for a change in his duties. So again, um, putting some emphasis on this contractual arrangement between the parties and effectively coming back to that idea that the employer is um, well, should be able to assume that an employee is up to the job that they sign on for. The next case is S and State of New South Wales. Now, this is a New South Wales Court of Appeal case, um, which the worker was successful. There was some talk about the um, State of New South Wales appealing or seeking special leave to the High Court. That has yet not happened. As of late, late last year, they were intending to, but either they haven't gone ahead or they have yet to, um, they have yet to appear before the High Court. But this is an interesting case in the sense of the plaintiff was an under undercover police officer. She was full-time undercover for three years and part-time for eight years. So it was highly stressful work. Um, Near the end of her employment, she experienced severe trauma as a result of two particular operations. Now, the defendant in this case conceded that her psychiatric disorders were caused by her involvement in police work, and the defendant um, significantly also conceded that there was a foreseeable risk of an undercover police officer suffering psychiatric disorder by reason of her work. The defendant, however, did not accept that a risk of injury to this particular plaintiff was foreseeable. The, particular the particulars of negligence included failing to provide the plaintiff with any adequate or adequate counselling or treatment, failing to put into place an operational system or some sort of guideline for rotation of duties after a stressful incident, and failing to rotate her out of undercover work or, and failing to, at an earlier time, stop her performing undercover work. 
There was expert evidence led in the case about the um, foreseeability of risk of harm in relation to undercover police, o um, police officers. She argued that the length of time that she spent as an undercover operative exceeded that which a reasonable employer would have permitted her to perform, bearing in mind the known risks of psych psychiatric disorder associated with undercover work. And the Court of Appeal accepted that argument. Now in this case, it was interesting because there was um, no real evidence of her complaints in relation to psychiatric vulnerability and so forth, as the courts have required in the other cases. Um, there was evidence that she was, um, had empathy or was sympathetic with um, some of the target, the undercover targets that she'd become close to. So her employer was aware of that. And what the court said was that is a clear problem for undercover officers because of that empathy that the employer knew of, it should have identified her as having a particular vulnerability. And the court found the employer negligent because the employer failed to have in place a system for regular reviews, counselling and treatment. And this case, I suppose, is... Um, bit different in the sense of the magnitude of the risk of injury was so great that a reasonable employer should have ensured that she had compulsory reviews, counselling and if, if required treatment. Um, because if she'd had that, the court found, her particular vulnerability would have been likely to be revealed. So effectively the signs were there but the employer was not aware of the signs because it did not have, a, have an, an adequate system in place. And when I refer to signs, that's, um, that's a term that the, the High Court used in Curler in relation to complaints made by employees. So you'll see the, the ambulance officer case in Queensland, the onus was really put on the employee to articulate his difficulties to the employer. Whereas this case, the onus had been put on the employer to have a system in place that would alert it to the signs. Um, now, it's arguable that if you have a, a, a plaintiff or a worker who does work in that kind of environment as an undercutter operative, and the magnitude of the risk is so great, um, then they don't necessarily have to complain specifically to the employer about psychiatric vulnerabilities. The employer um, should have systems in place that would alert them to those vulnerabilities. I've just referred there to the case of New South Wales and Seedsman um, for comparison. This is a case, a 2000 case, and I won't go into it in much detail, but it was a female police officer who worked in a child mistreatment unit. So she was exposed to, or she had to go and, um, for example, see autopsies performed on children who'd been beaten to death. She was a very junior police officer. She was investigating very traumatic um, sexual assaults on children and so forth. The defendant took no steps with regard to formal training or supervision, um, did not monitor stresses on people like her who were exposed to extreme stresses in the workplace. She developed post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the court found in her favour and found that it was reasonably foreseeable that police work of the character that she carried out could cause psychiatric illness. And she was a young recruit without special preparation, um, exposed to a litany of child abuse and other horrors. Now, query whether she would have succeeded in the light of Curla, um, although it's still arguable, as I said, that in, in particular cases of particularly inherently stressful work, the employer does have an obligation to provide safe employment and a system of regular assessments. So in these overwork or stressful work condition cases, um, you'll see from how the cases have been decided 
a lot of it focuses on this question of foreseeability, which will of course depend on the facts of the case. The interpretation of foreseeability against a contractual relationship arguably favours the employer and it's surprising in Curler that the High Court regarded that as significant in the sense that um, they said that, well, she, she took on the job so an employer is likely or, is, or should be able to rely on that because in Curler the actual letter of engagement that she signed said nothing about the duties of the job, only about the hours. Um, so in that sense it is surprising the High Court placed so much attention uh, um, on the contractual relationship when really there wasn't much evidence about it. But in, in any event, um, obviously the nature and extent of work performed is important and as I've said before, the signs from the employee in the form of complaints or frequent absences as well. And what an employer should do will depend on the facts of each case. Now, there are inherent difficulties in relation to these psychiatric injury cases. For example, a lot of employees are very unlikely to complain about psychiatric vulnerability because they don't want to alert, alert the employer about it. Um, it. It's also questionable whether how many employers will keep someone on or, or hire someone when they know of such psychiatric vulnerability. And in most cases, an employer is unlikely to be found liable if not made aware of warning signs. But of course, there are some circumstances where the inherent risk, or there's such a magnitude of risk, as in the undercover police case, that they do have a duty to perform screening and so forth of employees. I'm running out of time, but I'll just um, talk briefly about bullying and harassment because that's another side of these psychiatric injuries which is more and more common. Um, there's a case of New South Wales and Manor, which is a New South Wales Court of Appeal case. Now, this is a case about a, a woman who worked for the Department of Housing. She was appointed as a team leader over um, a man who'd also been working there for some time. There was a lot of hostility in relation to her appointment. Um, her area manager was a man called Singh, was one of the people who she claimed victimised and bullied her. The difference about this case, and I should say she succeeded, was that she, um, made, well, she first of all made numerous complaints, both orally and in writing. The court found that Singh, that's her area manager, <coughs> his response to her complaints was unreasonably inadequate and the court found there were practical measures that could have been done to prevent the harm. And, of and one of the main things about this case is that the, the employer was on actual notice that she was suffering from psychological problems as a result of the bullying. So she succeeded. The case of Bow and State of Victoria. Um, this is about a police officer who claimed she was required to work in a highly stressful environment and was also exposed to harassment by the head of the special projects unit. She also relied on 10 specific incidents throughout the course of her employment. Now this claim failed. Um, one of the main bases was the trial judge just found that many of the incidents did not occur and so that the allegations of the stressful work environment were not made out. But it's interesting to note that um, the Court of Appeal did hold that it is reasonably foreseeable that an employee who is exposed to sexist, bullying or demeaning workplace behaviour may suffer injury because of the cumulative effect of a series of minor events. Um, so that if the factual claims had been made out in this case, then there would have been sufficient evidence for her to succeed. And of course, the fact that she may have been more sensitive to harassment does not preclude her from recovering damages. Now, in these bullying and harassment cases, as David mentioned at the start, um, somewhat murky area and will necessarily involve complex 
factual disputes about who said what, who did what, what was not done. Foreseeability is arguably much more easily satisfied than in the inherently stressful work cases or overwork cases. Um, for example, a contractual relationship is not going to be relevant to the question of foreseeability because it's never going to be part of the contractual agreement that an employee is exposed to bullying and harassment. And it's well known in the community now, and a lot of cases have commented on this, that bullying and harassment can give rise to a psychiatric injury. It will be important to work out whether the employer was on actual notice of the psychiatric problems, or at least should have known of them, and whether practical measures of avoiding those problems or the risk was available to the employer. And there's also the issue of incorporation of anti-bullying protocols um, into employment contracts. And I've just gone through or included there the cases of Nicolich and Riverwood in relation to incorporation of workplace policies into employment contracts, and that is pleading breach of contract um, and I probably don't have time to go into it now, but really what needs to be considered is the employment contract itself and the intention between the parties when that contract was made that supports the incorporation argument. And that is, what does the contract itself say? Were any manuals given to the worker at the time of the contract or at the commencement of the employment? And in relation to the policy that the worker seeks to rely on as being incorporated into the contract, it's necessary to analyse whether the language and intent of the policy is promissory or aspirational. In, this, in the case of Nic Nicolich, it was held um, that one part of, one part of the manual, or, well, one part of it was promissory, and that the employer would, it said, the manual, I believe, said the employer would take every practicable step to provide and maintain a safe and health, healthy workplace environment. Whereas in the case of Bow that I previously referred to, it was also, it was argued there um, that the plaintiff argued um, there that in relation to the case of Nicolich, um, there was a breach of contract, but the Court of Appeal distinguished Nicolich because in that case it found that the policy was only aspirational. And that in that case, the plaintiff relied on the terms of a human relations policy and tried to argue it was implied into her contract of employment. But the court found um, the words, will aim to prevent inappropriate behaviour was not promissory, but rather aspirational. So it's important to look carefully at what documents are given to the worker at the time, what documents are um, relied on by the employer in relation to what do they give their workers and what is the precise language of those documents. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, for that very, very thorough analysis of recent cases. Um, those of you who are drawing these claims and want to include a contractual term, um, it's very wise to look carefully at Nicolich. It's, a, it's an interesting saga. Um, could you again th join me in thanking both Bruce and Fiona for a very informative session?